We have a very hot topic to talk about today, and that's the contemporary approach to heart failure, specifically with reduced ejection fraction. And we're going to spend some time addressing some of the pivotal management issues that have arisen in uh, contemporary management of these patients. This is a general outline in regards to what we're going to go over. As you can see here, we'll spend a good bit of time talking about the emerging pharmacotherapies and they, how they fit into the armamentarium of the treatment of HEFREF. Um, but we'll really explore the expert consensus document that was updated uh, most recently this year and published in JAK. But you can see some of the other outlines that are, are, we're going to talk about here, when to refer to a heart fire specialist, looking at medication adherence patterns, management of specific patient cohorts, take a deep dive into cost and the ramifications therein in 2021 with our patients with HEFREF. And then at the end, we'll just put it all together and try to make sense out of this. So delving in a little bit on the background and introduction here, um, you know, when I hear about discussion and talk about the quote unquote old days of heart failure in the late 80s and early 90s with the emergence of um, neurohormonal therapy, ACEs, ARBs, beta blockers, MRAs, I realize that um, this is just a small snapshot in time when it comes to the story of heart failure. And what you see here is actually the earliest reported case of a patient with chronic heart failure on record. This was a middle-aged uh, Egyptian dignitary um, who had the examin examination of his lung remnants and found a die of acute pulmonary edema due to presumed heart failure. So this is a disease entity that has been around for centuries indeed. So how are we growing? Well, we're growing very rapidly in the heart failure spectrum. <clears throat> and one of the best ways to measure growth and progress in this field um, is the volume of publications. And what you see here is just that, the volume of heart failure publications listed in PubMed at five-year intervals. And you can see the exponential growth rate that we've seen over time, particularly just in the last 20 years or so. And if you think about our specialty, it is actually quite young. Um, a couple of timestamps in the uh, timeline of heart failure. Our first journal, the Journal of Cardiac Failure, uh, started in 1994. Uh, dedicated to the, the management and assessment of heart failure. And in 2008, uh, ultimately, uh, the ABM finally recognized the discipline of advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology. And it wasn't until 2017 that CMS authorized new billing codes uh, that led to the authorization of services in the advanced heart failure spectrum. So we've come a long way very quickly um, in a short amount of time. So with all these therapies, how are we actually doing? Well, what you see here is uh, ultimately a cohort of patients in the UK, uh, and you're looking at survival by year of diagnosis, one year, five year, and 10 years. And you can see that we have made incremental improvements in survival over time, uh, but we really still have a long ways to go because the overall survival rates are still abysmal, as you can see, um, looking at one, five, and 10 year rates. Um, many of these patients perish, unfortunately. So where does this put us now? Well, you can see here, and I think this is a nifty slide, looking at the foundational and emerging therapies in HEFREF. And in the center, you kind of have the, the core foundational therapies that have evolved to manage patients with HEFREF. Um, this is the RAS inhibitors, ACEs, ARBs, and now of course, ARNIs. The SNS inhibitors, essentially beta blocker therapy, MRAs, including uh, mineralocorticoid antagonists, and then most recently the SGLT2 inhibitors to really round out this foundational therapy. And this should be the focus and the core for our patients with HEFREF. However, there are multiple emerging therapies or therapies that have been around for some time that are appropriately utilized in certain situations. And that may be fixed dose hydralazine and nitrates, which we have known for ultimately some time in regards to its benefit with the African-American subpopulation. Uh, evabridine, uh, myosin activators, omacanthus macarbal, the use of IV iron, and the guanylate cyclase stimulator, very Seguat. So as you can see, over time, as the armamentarium of our therapies has built, so has the complexities, and it has raised more questions for us as providers. So hopefully throughout this talk, we'll be able to answer some of those. So is it all worth it? Is it all worth having these therapies added on? The short answer is yes, it is. And what you see here is a network meta-analysis of 57 trials over the course of 30 years. And this was designed to really pull and indirectly compare all-cause mortality hazard ratios 
for intervention, pharmacotherapy intervention, whether it be solo therapy or combined therapy compared to placebo. And you can see here, starting with the initiation of just solo therapy ACE R beta blocker, there are incremental benefits. But beyond that, as we've known for some time now, stacking therapies um, leads to further benefit in terms of mortality. So certainly is worthwhile. More importantly, how are we actually doing in the real world? And what you see here is data from the CHAMP Heart Failure Registry. And this is a US-based database of 150 different cardiology and primary care practices with over 3,500 patients looking at ultimately HEFREF drug utilization. And it's pretty staggering indeed. And what you see in green here are the patients that are treated with the individual therapies. And in um, pink, I suppose, here are patients that are not being treated but have no contraindication to the use of the specific drug. And as you can see here on the left, moving left to right, ACEs and ARBs, 60% of eligible patients are on drug. ARNI, under 13% of eligible patients are on drug. <clears throat> ACE, ARB, or ARNI as a whole, just 72% of patients are, are on therapy, with another quarter of patients that could otherwise be treated are not. These numbers drop even more with the beta blockers, 66%. And then finally, with MRAs, even worse. So 33% of otherwise eligible patients are actually on drug therapy. So though we have all of this data that has built up over the course of time, the utilization rates are still abysmally low. So enter the, uh, the consensus document. And, and this was really designed to address the gaps in care that we have in HEFREF, and hopefully to answer some of the more pivotal issues and this is really an update to the 2017 consensus document. So uh, not new in and of itself, just providing updates because so much has changed over the course of the last four or five years. So really this is not necessarily meant to be driven by clinical trial data. And though I will present some of the clinical trial information, it's really meant to be data that we can get from real world clinical practice. So the, the um, trials that we'll present here are really just meant to be reference points um, and that, that alone. So the bulk of what we're gonna really talk about today is initiation, addition, and switching of goal-directed medical therapy and HEFREF. As we have talked about already, there are multiple different therapeutics at your disposal now to treat this condition. And with the emergence of all these new therapies comes increased complexity, more decision-making, cost issues, a multitude of different things arise as a result uh, of these new uh, drug treatments. <clears throat> and what you can see here is the proposed treatment algorithm uh, that was displayed in the consensus document. And uh, I think it's um, a very good actual algorithm. And it really starts and emphasizes that upfront when you have a patient with HEFREF, you should be ultimately starting an ACE, ARB, or ARNI. But the key difference here with this document is that ARNI is now a preferred treatment from this class due to the emergence of multiple trials of which we'll highlight <clears throat> in the coming slides. And, and one of these drugs, preferably in ARNI, should be combined with a beta blocker up front. Now, questions arise sometimes, well, we may not be in a clinical situation where both can be initiated up front. Which one do we use? Generally speaking, ACE, ARBs, and, and certainly ARNIs tend to be better tolerated in the patient with some congestion on board and not overtly dry, whereas beta blockers tend to be better tolerated in the uh, euvolemic dry patients. So if it comes down to one therapy or the other that we're looking to initiate, Keep in mind the congestive status and the hemodynamic status. Beyond that, you can see there's a lot of wiggle room and flexibility for the clinician and the general providers in regards to what therapy to add next. And some of the variables that will dictate the response include renal function, electrolyte status, volume status certainly, uh, ethnicity, um, and ultimately some hemodynamic data, including heart rate at rest. So you have some option, that's really why this algorithm is set up this way. But at the end of the day, we have now evolved, and we'll highlight this again, into more of a quadruple therapy setting where we're looking to optimize an ACE ARB or preferably ARNI in conjunction with a beta blocker, an MRA, and an SGLT2 inhibitor. But ultimately, there is some flexibility and wiggle room here in regards to the sequence of initiation and how you should apply these therapies. So talking a little bit about the angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors, or ARNIs, and this is ultimately Secubitril Valsartan. At this point, um, most everybody that's listening in is familiar with this drug and has had experience with this drug over time. Uh, 
Um, its mechanism, for those that are not familiar, is novel. In essence, it harnesses two different pathways. One, the renin-angiotensin system by blocking the angiotensin receptor subtype 1 uh, with the use of valsartan. And the second pathway uh, really harnesses the augmentation of the natriated peptide system, which is done at the level of the circulating endopeptidase neprolysin. Neprolysin is a fairly promiscuous, I say, um, endopeptidase in that it really ultimately serves to break down many different vasoactive peptides, uh, but most namely the natriata peptide BNP. So by inhibiting that circulating endopeptidase, we increase circulating levels of BNP. When combined uh, with um, receptor antagonism at the angiotensin receptor level, we have the benefits that we see, vasodilation, diuresis, naturesis, vascular remodeling, and ultimately leading to the improvement in clinical outcomes that were observed across now multiple different clinical trials. And the current indication originally for use, as you can see at the top, are for those with a reduced ejection fractions, symptomatic heart failure on a background of goal-directed medical therapy. But now with the emergence of all these clinical trials now as a result of after paradigm, um, we really are seeking to utilize this drug, if possible, up front as our priority RAS inhibitor. And what are those lines of evidence? And you can see here initially this all started with Paradigm, and we're not going to spend really a lot of detailed time talking about Paradigm, but that's what led to the approval of the therapy. But since that time, multiple different um, clinical trials have been produced to help answer some of these lingering questions that emanated from the results of Paradigm. One of these questions was whether or not to initiate the drug in the hospital. How would this drug affect de novo HEFREF patients? How would this affect patients that were naive to RAS inhibitors entirely? What about the African-American population? There were only 5% of African-Americans in the clinical trial of Paradigm. So in an attempt to build the evidence base and answer some of these lingering questions, entered the, pri the pioneer trial, the PROVE trial, evaluate and transition trials as well. And, and with Pioneer, it really helped answer multiple different questions, in, in large part the safety and efficacy of initiating Secubitril Valsartan in the hospital in acutely decompensated patients. And what we found out that not only was this drug safe relative to enalapril, but it led to a very favorable reduction in natriated peptide levels and on secondary analysis, improvement in clinical outcomes over a very short period of time. What about the de novo population? Well, both the transition and the Pioneer trial looked at this. Um, a fair number of the patients in Pioneer, roughly 30%, were actually brand new heart failure patients that had not been exposed to ACE and or ARB up front. Uh, very similar in transition as well. <clears throat> and what we found out is that as a result of, of these trials, um, regardless of whether or not patients were de novo HEFREF or not, there was a safety and benefit. Beyond that, there has been a lot of discussion in regards to why these drugs work so well. What is the mechanism at play? And uh, as a result of these questions, several trials, both prove and evaluate, have attempted to look at this. In particular, looking at the reverse remodeling data that's out there, uh, prove in particular showed reduction in LV volumes and improvement in systolic performance in patients um, that were on uh, Secubitril valsartan. So it gives us a little insight in regards to mechanism that may be behind the clinical benefit of the drug therapy itself. And then finally, the rate of up titration. We'll talk a little bit about getting people on the right doses of therapy in a little bit, um, but <clears throat> asking the question about whether rapid titration was just as effective and safe uh, as a more conservative approach. And in transition, there were two groups, one that was ultimately subjected to rapid titration of Secubitril valsartan over three weeks compared to a conservative approach of six weeks up titration to gold dose, 97103. And to summarize, essentially, what the investigators found is that regardless of the strategy that was utilized, um, there was an equal number of patients that were tolerating maximum dose drug at 12 weeks. So it appears safe and effective to be moving the dosing up of Secubitril valsartan on a fairly rapid clip. So I think it's very fair and important to talk a little bit about the potential pitfalls. Uh, and this is not necessarily specific just to angiotensin receptor neprolysin inhibitors. All new therapies go through some degree of this. Um, but one in particular um, are side effects. Uh, I think hypotension has certainly gained enough interest. And this obviously was a, a 
appropriately seen in both Paradigm and Pioneer. Um, the rates of hypotension, symptomatic hypotension, were in and around 15% uh, for the randomized population in both of these studies. And in Pioneer, 20% of patients permanently discontinued the therapy. I think it's important to note, though, in Pioneer, the rates of permanent discontinuation were very similar between enalapril and Secubitril Valsartan. But I think it's important to, to pause and look at the hemodynamic profile of the patients that you're looking to initiate this drug on. I, I think patients that are obviously hypotensive at baseline, severely hypotensive, potentially hypovolemic, may run into further trouble down the road with tolerability. So I think it's important to know your patients and know their hemodynamic profile. Just as important is the financial, and, and we will spend more time on this as well because this is incredibly important. Um, with any new therapy, there are obviously concerns with copays and insurance coverage. Um, in all reality, um, the traditional neurohormonal therapies, ACE, R, beta blocker, MRA, are inexpensive if not free. So very hard to compete with that from a financial perspective. However, what I will say is that things have certainly evolved um, when it comes to Secubitril, Valsartan, and access. And I think we owe it to ourselves as providers to really seek out the best care and access for our patients. Um, and I think in large part that can be achieved by a team approach. And, and this is a general theme of this talk, is engaging in your team members. And that may be pharmacists, clinical pharmacists, social workers, um, patient navigators. These providers, these ancillary providers can help your patients and help you ensure that they get the appropriate access to care that they need, um, particularly exploring opportunities from a financial assistance through the insurance companies, not through the insurance company, but through the drug companies themselves um, is readily available and actually quite simple if you take the time to address it. So I, I think it's very helpful to approach these patients in 2021 as a team. So sliding into a very interesting topic and a group of drugs, and, and, and pretty much everybody in the room here is familiar now with the impact that the SGLT2s have had in the HEFREF space. But I think it's good to look in a little bit in terms of the timeline. I'm obviously not gonna go through every little detail here, but the point is is that things have evolved tremendously in the last 15 years or so. And, and this kind of all emanates from the early 2000s uh, when there were safety concerns with several drug classes um, including the TZDs. And as a result of that, in 2008, the FDI lended guidance to the industry and mandated that cardiovascular outcome trials, or CVOTs, had to be performed to ensure safety of diabetes drugs coming to market. As a result of these CVOTs, these cardiovascular outcomes trials, an unexpected cardiovascular benefit emerged, um, particularly in patients with HEFREF, low ejection heart failure in the GLP-1 agonist, but namely the SGLT2 inhibitors as well. So this has led to an explosion um, in the um, research space and the utilization, overall utilization in HEFREF. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in the next couple of minutes. So what's the actual proposed mechanism of action? This is probably the most common question that we'll get. And I, I think the short answer is, we don't know exactly the details behind each every individual mechanistic step with this drug therapy, but some of the more commonly accepted mechanisms are listed here, namely the stimulation of naturesis and osmotic diuresis, but also the impact on myocardial energetics, kind of a shift more towards ketone body utilization in the failing heart seems to be much more effective in, in HEFREF. But as you can see, the list continues to go on and on here and, and just due to a lack of time, we can't go through each one. But the point is, is that <clears throat> the mechanisms are multiple and they go way beyond the impact on glycemic lowering. And we know that very clearly as a result of multiple randomized clinical trials. And you can see the two big ones here. Most of y'all are familiar with this, both the DAPA-HF with dapagliflozin, but also the Emperor Reduce with empagliflozin. And both of these were in a population of patients with HEFREF and not to get into a tremendous amount of detail, but just some of the highlights. You can see with DAPA, HF, and Emperor Reduce, the population were fairly similar um, in DAPA, HF. This was a population of HEFREF patients on drug treatment with DAPA gliflozin plus the standard of care versus the standard of care alone. And these patients were well treated, about 4,000 patients or so, and they looked at worsening heart failure and CV death. And over a year and a half, they found significant reductions uh, 
and in the primary endpoint with dapagliflozin. And, and, and this was fairly well replicated with Emperor Reduced. And th these patients were a little sicker, their ejection fraction's a little lower, their GFR's lower. Um, so, but that being said, the primary outcome of hospitalization for heart failure and CV death was met over just 15 months with a relative risk reduction of 25%. So what does this mean for us practically? Uh, it does show, I think, consistently that this class of drugs reduces heart failure hospitalizations. Just as importantly, the benefit is clearly there regardless of diabetes status. So roughly 50% of the patients that were enrolled in these trials were non-diabetics. And I think that's obviously very important to mention to our patients as well as you're initiating therapy. They'll read about this and, and, and see a diabetes drug. So I think it's, it's important to mention that to our patients as well. And, and the benefits were independent of baseline heart failure pharmacotherapy. And that includes the use of Secubitril Valsartan. So clearly this drug works independently of goal-directed medical therapy, but also synergistic. So really, as a result of what we've seen, now we have, as I had alluded to earlier, a core four or quadruple therapy to look to initiate and maintain in patients with HEFREF. There are some questions about the heterogeneity of mortality benefit across this class, particularly CV mortality. Um, if you look at the primary endpoint in Emperor Reduced, uh, ultimately, though the primary endpoint is met, the individual endpoint of CV mortality crossed the line of unity, suggesting that there may be um, uh, less of an effect on mortality. Um, but at the end of the day, when you look at a, the meta-analysis data comparing both of these tri trials as a pool, there was no heterogeneity of benefit whatsoever, suggesting that this is a, a class effect between these two drugs in regards to hospitalization for heart failure and overall mortality. So my final thoughts on this particular class of drugs, general acceptance now to use either dapagliflozin or empagliflozin in those with an ejection fraction of 40% or less with or without diabetes uh, with symptomatic heart failure in conjunction with a background of GDMT, so essentially quadruple therapy. I will mention that the only FDA-approved drug to treat HEFREF um, in this class is still dapagliflozin, with the final say on whether or not empagliflozin will join it um, coming soon. I think it's important to initiate early on. I think that when you look at the curves and how quickly they separate from a mortality and hospitalization perspective, it's not delayed. So early initiation is best, even starting drug when prior therapies, perhaps Arnie and beta blocker are not truly maximized. Caution with volume depletion, we do spend time with our patients talking a little bit about the impact of volume depletion given the natritic effects and the osmotic diuresis we see with the drug. And then there is an uncertain benefit in those with significant impairment in renal function with dapagliflozin, that being a GFR less than 30, and with empagliflozin, a GFR less than 20. But when you think about an add-on therapy in the complex world of HEFREF in 2021, I think none are better suited than the SGLT2 inhibitors. Why? Well, for several reasons. Number one, there's a single dose. Um, it's 10 milligrams for dapagliflozin uh, and empagliflozin. Uh, it's a once daily utilization, so you're not dealing with a twice or three times a day daily drug. And the toler tolerability on a backdrop of goal-directed therapy is actually quite good. So I think they're well suited as add-on therapy in this environment. So what are our general tenets as we close out this aspect of the talk when we're talking about pharmacotherapy? I think it's important up front to set clinical expectations and identify potential barriers for all your patients. That may start in the hospital bed when they're decompensated or at that first clinic appointment, but you need to know where these patients come from, what barriers they will be facing and you will be facing as their provider. And I think as a result of that, it will make things easier for everybody down the road. When it comes to medication titration, I think it's important to remember that it's, it's not only appropriate, but it's safe to titrate medications in most patients every two weeks, which puts us at a challenging spot for providers in heart failure to be able to manage patients every two weeks. But we want to get to goal therapy sooner rather than later, ideally within that three to six month mark from diagnosis. And, and how can we do that? I think a structured titration plan will help, and that may be specific to the individual patients. And this is where things such as our heart failure resource centers, of which we have multiple here in the system, can be incredibly helpful from a drug management perspective, but also the utilization of virtual visits. I think that this is a thing that many of us thought was just 
relative to the pandemic itself, but as we continue to fight through this and emerge from the pandemic, I think virtual visits still have a critical role for some of our patients, particularly when it comes to just drug titrations. This can be done for many patients simply uh, through a virtual visit and avoiding them from coming all the way into the office and, and experiencing copays, et cetera. Furthermore, I think volume status is critical. We have to do a better job at managing volume status with diuretic adjustments as needed. And, and I think you know this could be a whole talk in of itself in regards to the role of cardiomems in these patients. But for some of our folks, this may be very appropriate in an effort to keep them euvolemic and out of the hospital. Some of the misconceptions that surround tolerability and safety in MRAs reflected by the poor utilization in the CHAMP heart fire registry continue to permeate, particularly in North America as opposed to the world. And a lot of that has persisted and, and evolved from early studies that came out suggesting there were safety issues. But in all reality, MRAs are very safely utilized when you follow the appropriate blood testing parameters to assess for hyperkalemia and renal insufficiency. So I think that's very important to mention. And I had alluded to earlier, it's important to note that you do not necessarily need to maximize beta blocker ace arb RNA prior to the addition of SGLT2 inhibitors and or MRA therapy. We know that timing is key for these patients, so initiating drug therapy early on um, is, is very important. And the management of hyperkalemia, again, another topic we could spend a lot of time on. Uh, it serves as a roadblock for up titration, initiation and up titration of RS inhibitors. Utilization though of some of the novel binders that are out there may actually help potentially achieve your goals from a up titration perspective. And please, please, please don't forget um, that hydralazine and nitrates, particularly in African Americans with functional class three and four symptoms are there and should be utilized appropriately. So shifting to another topic entirely, and this is a popular one, is really when do you actually send patients to us? And this is an age-old issue that we've had, and it's a common grievance among advanced heart failure specialists is that late referrals are no good for anybody. Um, we really do promote early referrals. It is never, ever too early to send a patient to an advanced heart failure specialist. Um, it is potentially a period of time when it's too late to send it. And why is that? Because when you send them late, lots of bad things unfortunately have already happened. Whether it's progressive right heart failure, significant renal and liver disease, fixed pulmonary hypertension, cardiac cachexia, or all of those things. And why is that the case? And I think these are issues that we have observed from the very beginning. A lack of awareness of prognosis is a big problem. And then really just the unawareness of eligibility cri criteria for advanced options for heart failure itself. And, how can you remember as a general practitioner or a general provider in cardiology? Well, there's a mnemonic that you can utilize, the I need help mnemonic. For many of you, this may be um, old information, but for those that you that it's not, this is what it's listed as. And you can see various different things that you can check off and evaluate very simply for your patients in clinic. Um, and if any one of these ultimately are consistent with what you're seeing in your patient, it may be actually appropriate to refer them to a heart failure specialist. Furthermore, another indication may just simply be a new onset half ref patient. Um, as you know, the etiology of heart failure can be difficult to discern here in 2021. There are multiple different conditions that may be hiding in the weeds, infiltrative cardiomyopathy. Data suggests that about 13% of hospitalized patients with heart failure, more so with preserved ejection fraction, may actually have amyloid. The familial nature of uh, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy as well deserves some discussion. We'll talk about that, but that may lead to consideration for genetic testing, um, which we can facilitate as well. The need for advanced imaging. We have exploded, um, literally exploded from an advanced imaging perspective uh, with MMR and PET, um, technetium pyrophosphate scanning and amyloid. But for specific disease entities such as amyloidosis and sarcoidosis, there are now distinct and fairly developed diagnostic pathways that incorporate the need for advanced imaging. And then finally, just simply to determine the sequence of utilization of all these different therapies that we have. Given how complex the nature is right now, we can certainly can lend guidance from that perspective. Just circling back and looking at genetics, this is a 487 um, patient, small patient trial looking at idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy folks with potentially familial history. And, and you can see a fair number of these patients in this cohort tested positive for pathogenic mutations. 
um, roughly 35 to 37 percent. And you can see the distribution of variants at the bottom, but the important point here is by genetically testing these patients, we were able, they were able to uncover several different uh, malignant variants that increased the risk for sudden cardiac death, VT and VF most namely um, the desmosomal mutations and the LMNA mutations. So I think it's important to be thinking about this and, and certainly with referral to an advanced heart failure um, cardiologist, this would, would certainly happen. And then finally, just simply an annual review of your patients with HEFREF. Why, why is that necessary? Well, because of what we've been discussing over the last 20 minutes, to evaluate for emerging and potential therapies to evaluate potentially for methods in which we can reduce hospitalizations for heart failure. Maybe that's some of the newer therapies that have come out, the soluble guanylate cyclase um, in, uh, stimulators, and also the use of cardiomems to reduce hospitalizations. Screening for clinical trial participation. Here at Piedmont, we have multiple different clinical trials in the heart failure spectrum that may benefit our patients. Just simply recalculating the disease trajectory for our patients with heart failure is important given how quickly this process can change. So I think that is helpful. And then advanced care planning for those patients that may not be candidates for advanced surgical options for heart failure. We can apply and, 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 and basically provide all of these different um, um, therapies. Finally here, improving medication adherence. This is a huge issue for our patients with, with heart failure. Non-adherence is common with rates between 20 and 50% depending on how you actually define non-adherence. As you know, this is not a dichotomous variable, but a continuous one. But ultimately, know the rates are unacceptably high. And, and interestingly enough, the rates of non-adherence appear to be more unintentional than intentional driven. And they clearly seem to differ by drug class. And, and this is where you know hydralazine and nitrates gets picked on quite a bit. But when you look at some of the data, particularly with the Get With The Guidelines database, they found that for those over 65, only 22% of African Americans who are otherwise um, appropriate candidates for the utilization of hydralazine and nitrates are actually prescribed it. And for those that are not using RAS inhibitors over 65, only 18% of those in this database were utilizing hydralazine and nitrates. So, and if you look at the, the discharge prescription fill rates, only 50% are filling hydralazine and nitrates within 90 days of hospital discharge. So clearly there's an impact by drug class. And it comes to no surprise that this is associated with worse outcomes. What are the reasons for non-inherence? I won't go through all of these, but you can see they're numerous. And they starts with patient-centric problems. This may be something simply poor medical literacy. And you know these sorts of things can be teased out once again early on during the the hospitalization even and the first follow-up visit. The medical conditions themselves, we have a patient population of which there are about 50% of patients with HEFREF who have four or more non-cardiac comorbidities and 25% will have six or more non-cardiac comorbidities. The frequency of dosing and therapy, we talked about the barriers there with hydralazine and nitrates. Clearly socioeconomic barriers exist as well when it comes to utilizing pharmacy. And this is once again, where nurse coordinators, pharmacists, social workers can help you tremendously in terms of gaining access to therapies for our patients. And then the health system itself. I mean, we practice kind of in these individual silos of care, um, and we may have providers over different specialties in completely different health systems, in different EMRs. So this really is a call to improve the communication between our providers here in the, uh, in the health system. What can we do better? Um, we can identify the barriers up front, as I've been mentioning all this time. Simplify, simplify, simplify. When you look at these med lists, look how long they are, and there's a lot of medications that potentially could be um, de-escalated or even discontinued um, because they're not clinically necessary. Consider the medication costs as well. The patient assistance programs through the drug companies are generally very good um, and can be accessed pretty easily. So I think it's important for us as providers to be familiar with how these programs actually work so we can get patients therapies. Educate the patients with friendly approaches. For me, it's just pulling up a chair and going through the med list quickly, identifying the therapies that they're on for familiarity, and we do this every time to help, once again, improve adherence over the long haul. Integrating our pharmacists and patient navigators, we've been mentioning this off and on now for since the beginning of this talk, and then monitoring adherence, and that can come 
through ultimately calling pharmacies to see how patients are filling their prescriptions, utilization of home health care nurses, et cetera. But all of these things can be applied to help improve overall outcomes for patients with heart failure. As we swing down to the last couple of topics, I wanted to, to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the underrepresented patient cohorts that were also highlighted in the consensus document here uh, in 2021. And that's namely the African-American population and the elderly. And, and particularly with the African-American population, we all know that there is a higher prevalence of occurrence of HEFREF uh, in this subgroup with higher rates of death and a more malignant course. And unfortunately, underrepresented in pretty much all clinical trials outside of AHEFT over the course of time. And what you see here is the MESA uh, study. Uh, we're probably familiar with this. It's a multi-center cohort study of about 6,800 patients looking at outcomes over four years um, of incident heart failure by ethnicity. And you can see here the African-American um, subgroup clearly outpaces that of their counterparts. Um, beyond that, the, the factors that are associated with more malignant courses for patients with HEFREF includes the African-American population. You can see here in the Pinnacle Registry, uh, they looked at 11,000 patients and followed them for a year and a half, and in particular, highlighted the, the, the variable of African-American status and, and, and a more malignant course for patients with HEFREF. So this has been replicated again and again. And when you look at the actual treatments themselves, um, Honestly, there's gaping holes in the evidence for various therapies that are not only commonly accepted, but strongly recommended as class one indications in heart failure. And that spans the ACE inhibitor class, ARBs, beta blockers, MRAs, CRT. The point here, and, and, I'll, and I'll go on and talk a little bit more about the elderly population as well. Um, and that is the next slide, uh, which we'll show in a minute. So generally, the elderly population, those over 75, are also poorly represented in clinical trials. Um, generally, ages over the age of 80 are really relegated to just cohort studies and observational data. But when you look at some of the clinical trials that did enroll patients over the age of 80, particularly the DAPA-HF trial, which enrolled patients up to the age of 94, we found that ultimately the benefit of dapagliflozin in the elderly relative to their younger counterparts was very similar. Now, adherence rates and side effects and tolerability tended to be lower, um, but at the end of the day, I think that we should still strive to achieve these therapies in our elderly population if we're able to do so, um, but we just need to be aware that tolerance may be an issue. So gradual, slow titration, I think, is very, very important. So as we wind things down, what about the impact of comorbidities in pharmacotherapy on patient cost? As I had mentioned earlier, about half of patients with HEFREF have four or more non-cardiac comorbidities. About 25% will have six or more non-cardiac comorbidities, of which the more common ones you can see here. And I've highlighted diabetes in particular because the polypharmacy in diabetes itself is growing as well. And since this makes up, makes up, up to 40% of patients with heart failure, I think you're competing with now multiple different drug therapies. And the average prescription rate for a heart failure patient is about seven to eight medications, with most patients taking more than 10 doses per day. So this is a, a huge problem and is probably going to get worse as we continue to evolve from a pharmacotherapy perspective. How does this look in terms of patient cost? Well, you can see this here. After hospitalizations, which still leads the way from a cost perspective, pharmacotherapy uh, is the second biggest price tag when it comes to managing patients with HEFREF at a tune of about $7 billion. And where does this go over time? Well, what you're looking at here is medications by class on hospital admission on the top and on discharge on the bottom and stratified by year, 2003 to 2006 on the left, in the middle 2007 to 10, and on the right 2011 to 2014. And the, the, the synopsis of this is that when patients uh, ultimately are admitted to the hospital and then they're discharged, the number of medication, as you would expect, goes up. And that's from a total medication perspective, when, but when broken down from a heart failure standpoint, from a cardiac non-heart failure standpoint, and from a non-cardiac perspective. And the rates of overall medication usage, usage as expected over time, um, are also going up. So this is an evolving issue that is a real thing that we need to face and address here in 2021. How can we actually reduce patients' cost of care? And we've highlighted some of these things already. Uh, I think 
Coordinating care is critical, once again, between providers. How many times do patients get multiple echocardiograms within the same year that may not need to be done? Um, imaging, particularly, but also lab work. Labs are done by primary care, maybe a week before, and then they see their cardiologist and get another lab test of the same type. And this could be ultimately reduced to avoid costs or minimize costs for our patients. Looking at the medication coverage, and this comes with knowing your patients, um, and really when there's underinsured patients or non-insured patients seeking out assistance to help get them on the therapies um, at little or no cost. Using generic equivalents when possible, and really once again, a general theme of this talk, utilizing your pharmacists, your social workers, and your navigators to help achieve goal-directed medical therapy um, for our patients. So at the end of the day, how do we put it all together? And this is the last segment of the talk. Um, you can see here, and this is driven, uh, taken actually from the, um, the consensus document, you have 12 different mechanisms at play in the pathology of HEFREF. And you can see the various different therapies that are utilized to treat patients with these adverse mechanisms at play. This is incredibly complicated now. We have clearly evolved from just an ACE and a beta blocker um, which was kind of the mantra for years and years. And, and we've evolved into a very complex mess at times that needs to be appropriately addressed. And it's clearly an individual one for our patients here in 2021. And these guiding principles, and there are several here that we'll just go through as we conclude. Number one, we need to prioritize the pharmacotherapies with the highest proven benefit. And that's the core four, the quadruple therapy of ACE-ARB, preferably ARNI, beta blocker, MRA, and SGLT2 inhibitor. Targeting doses should still be a goal of treatment even if there's clinical stability. Overcoming that therapeutic inertia that we see with providers where med therapies are left alone um, because the provider deems the patient to be quote unquote stable. Start goal-directed medical therapy immediately. The deferral and treatment initiation can be devastating for all these different therapies and you see that. Uh, no more obvious than this meta-analysis of several different randomized trials. And what you're looking at in gray is the mortality rate at one year for patients that are on, in this case, triple therapy, um, 10%. But you can see with patients that are on two therapies or one therapy or no therapies, there's incremental rates of mortality at one year. And if you look to the far right, for patients that are not on any therapies, just at one year from diagnosis, you tack on an additional 12% increase in mortality for these patients. So it's important to get therapy started early and get them going. Attention to the clinical, social, and financial barriers to achieving goal-directed medical therapy, one of the highlights of this talk for sure. Diligent management of patient's volume status, we've highlighted on that. Careful management of potential drug side effects will actually improve overall tolerability. Avoidance of hypotension, monitoring for hyperkalemia, looking at drug-drug interactions. Uh, when you anticipate and can act ahead of time proactively, this may actually help improve overall adherence patterns um, to goal-directed therapy and hopefully outcomes. And then finally, primary prevention devices only, only after consistent use of optimal doses of GDMT for at least three to six months. And, our hope and our goal is to get patients on optimal therapy at good doses by that time with targeted follow-up. We should continue to focus on, of course, mortality and hospitalization as primary outcomes, but really also what gets forgotten is the patient themselves and their symptoms, focusing on functional capacity and overall well-being. We didn't spend much time at all talking about structural heart. We just didn't have the time, but in all reality, there is a role for mitral valve, transcatheter mitral valve repair with patients in moderate to severe MR despite optimal doses of GDMT. And just a slide on that, there's divergent results, of course, in the two clinical trials, the Mitra FR and the COAP, but they're different patient populations. The COAP trial had to be on good medical therapy. It was mandated as opposed to those in Mitra FR. And if you look at the actual patients in both of these trials, those in COAP had more mitral regurgitation and less myopathy. And what I mean by that is the ejection fractions tend to be a little better in co-op. The LV dimensions were smaller. So more valvular disease, less myopathy in co-op compared to Mitra FR. And it was co-op that showed the significant clinical benefits from mortality in heart failure hospitalization that was not seen in Mitra FR. So that sweet spot um, for some patients may be in the folks with significant valvulopathy with significant MR
but not too much myopathy. So their ejection fraction is mild to moderately depressed um, with dimensions that are not significantly enlarged. And then finally, assess the overall value of each therapy to your patient. Balance of benefit and burden is key. We need to essentially evaluate each of our patients individually to determine if the intervention that we want to apply is gonna be effective for our patient and it's gonna be cost effective and appropriate for them in their clinical scenario. And a lot of that is decided through a shared decision model. We need to talk to our patients to ba basically better take care of them. And then finally, once again, my last push for a team-based care approach, it is critical. So APPs, pharmacists, nurses, facilitate frequent follow-up through the use of a team-based approach. Utilization of remote monitoring and telehealth can be incredibly helpful. So I think these are tenets and general guiding principles for the management of patients with HEFREF here in 2021. And, and I just wanted to end with our team. This is our advanced heart failure physician team here at uh, Piedmont Heart Institute. Uh, we have a, a fantastic leadership program here and great providers. Uh, we have, of course, uh, APPs as well, which do a fantastic job. But uh, we span, uh, obviously, across the state of Georgia now in, in Mountainside, in Athens, the South Side, and, of course, here in Atlanta. With that being said, that is the end of the talk today. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, with the time we have left, I'd be happy to uh, answer any of the questions. Thank you.